Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 21st day, one day more than yesterday, of November in the year of our Lord, 2023. I can never figure out where I want the microphone. Yes, so uh, I guess this is working. All right. Never satisfied with the engineer and me. Keep changing things. Never satisfied. Okay, so uh, I'm not quite sure what this is going to end up about. It's I think I'm going to talk about post-millennialism and theonomy and the uh, the craziness going on out there right now. It, every once in a while, every decade or so, it seems to rear its ugly head and then it creates a firestorm and then it goes undercover until it... It's like COVID. It keeps coming back in slightly different forms. But I'm not sure it's getting less harmless. COVID is, but the others... It's down to about a mild cold now, I think, at least from what I've experienced. <clears throat> Round two. Who knows how many times I've been infected with it? Who knows? My, my the, the symptom that, that tells me that it's probably that is when I lose my sense of smell. And the first time, I lost it for like a couple of months. This time for about a week. But other than that, it's like a little bit of, little bit of congestion, a little gunky throat. I think one day it was a little swollen. Ah. I was actually able to jog a little bit <laughs> for a block with the dog yesterday. I was willing to do that. I felt like doing that. And I took her for a walk, and I thought, well, let's run down this thing, give her a little exercise, and get my heart rate up a little bit. All right, so uh, back on subject here. You don't need to hear about me, do you? This is not supposed to be about me, uh, but I don't know. Here we go. So, first of all, I want, there, there was a, uh, I've seen a lot of people going nuts about what happened in Ohio uh, a couple weeks ago, I guess it was now. The pro-life people, the people that, that think that, well, they're all upset about legalizing abortion. Again, that's a relatively recent phenomenon, of course, uh, Roe versus Wade. And this, the court struck it down because it was a bad decision. It really was a bad decision. If they had simply left it alone to start with and left it in the hand of the states, and uh, but there are people out there that are Christians that think the solution to sin is to pass laws. Let me point out, that God gave the law of Moses, 613 commandments. Did that make Israel a good people? <laughs> if you know the history of the Old Testament, no. Did it make this, the current state of Israel, does it make them good? The law of Moses? No. They are, that it, right now, that has to be one of the most wicked, evil countries on earth. What they're doing in Gaza and the West Bank, and what they've been doing for the last 75 years. Some people should not be allowed a country of their own, I don't think. I mean, they need to be kept supervised. Can You know, the United Nations, if the United States didn't hasn't been working since uh, Ronald Reagan to destroy that institution, it could be useful. Uh, you know, but People like the United States doesn't want to be part of a of a international system of government. They want to be the king of the world, and they won't be satisfied with anything else. That is political dominionism. And what we're going to talk about a little bit is Christian dominionism, Christian nationalism, which is really a, another gospel. It is another gospel, and that makes it lethal to people. If that becomes your gospel, you've departed from Christ. So let's look at the Ohio thing a bit. And I'm going to say something that many people are not going to like and may stop following me. But it's I'm going to say it anyway. Voters back abortion rights, but some opponents won't relent. Is the commitment to democracy in question? Really? That's pretty bizarre. 
Christians, real Christians, we're not committed to a democracy. That's of the world. Democracy means the people rule. Christians, we believe that Jesus Christ rules over us. He has not yet picked up his scepter and begun to rule over the world. And that's talked about in the book of Revelation. And uh, the proper translation is it's an ingressive aorist. It means taken up his scepter and begun to rule. That hasn't happened yet. No, no. He, because he has a purpose for why he hasn't begun, why he hasn't come and judged the world which is a premillennial position, that Christ returns in judgment. Once he returns, the offer of the gospel is off the table. Make peace with the judge, with your opponent, before he takes his seat on the judgment seat. Make a plea deal. He has an offer on the table. Believe in the Son of God. Believe in Jesus Christ. And all your sins are forgiven. Refuse to do that, and you will die in your sins. And you will not escape God's justice. It is God's grace and mercy or his justice. One of the two. He will receive his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness, his love all the promises of God, or you will experience God's justice. Your choice. Choose wisely. Wasn't that a line from that Indiana Jones movie? Oh, yeah, the cup. Pick wisely. Choose wisely. Uh, yeah. Which cup was the authentic holy grail, so so to speak? Yeah. Which which cup did Jesus actually use? One gilded with gold? <laughs> no. Yeah. <clears throat> was he dressed in purple and scarlet? No. He was not. So uh, anyway, the, this uh, abortion decision here. What's, what I'm going to say that's very controversial is what does it, difference does it make whether the state passes a law against it or not? When states had laws against abortions, people still got abortions. They just were not subsidized. Uh, but the, the the responsibility for abortion is on the one who hires the abortionist. It is on the one who commits abortion, who kills their child, who murders their offspring. It is not on the state whether it's legal or not legal. So why are people trying to deal with the government, see, Jesus said that if a man looks on a woman to lust after her in his heart, uh, he has already committed adultery. Why? Because he wants to. He desires the sin. Whether he's able to do it or not, or restrains himself for some reason or not, isn't the issue. The fact that he would, if there wasn't a penalty, makes him already guilty of it. He would do it if he could get away with it. Just out of fear, perhaps, he restrains himself. And law has a useful purpose in that. But it doesn't solve the problem of a heart, a wicked heart that desires to murder. The problem is in the heart. You cannot legislate goodness. It doesn't work. That's like legislating the weather. It doesn't work because it's not under your control. So whether the the state passes a law uh, for abortion, allowing abortion or not, does not change 
the, the wickedness of the act, nor who is responsible for it. Unless the woman is, uh, has her child aborted under duress, she's guilty. And anyone that's complicit in that act is guilty before God. And that's what's important. Who cares what the governor of Ohio says or the legislature of Ohio? They are all sinful human beings. Their opinion means nothing. It's only a, an opinion. And that's what democracy is. It's only an opinion of the majority of the people. And where are you ever going to have a country that is, has a majority good, holy, and righteous people? It doesn't happen in this world, in this age. Democracy is a bad idea because the majority of people are bad. Sinners. Unregenerate sinners. And so they'll vote for what they love, sin. So what happened in Ohio is just a manifestation of democracy. The, rule, the majority rules, and the majority are always sinners. So why should we be surprised or shocked? Commit to, I have no commitment to democracy. It's an evil system. It's a bad system. Democracy is only, only suitable for regenerate people, people that have their hearts transformed by God. Then why do we need government at all? Government is ordained by God for the world, for sinners, not for the righteous, for sinners. The righteous don't need law. Christ is our king. He rules over us. There's a lot of confused Christians out there. They think they're going to fix, they can fix things through law. Law can't make people good. It might hold back some of the damage, and I'm not sure... You know, first of all, when, when the wicked abort their children, they are fulfilling the very words of God, because God says in the Psalms that the children of the wicked shall be cut off. They're cutting off their own children, fulfilling God's word. And I'm not sure it is the worst thing that can happen to those children. They're not regenerate, but... So, so they are they're, they are not going into the very presence of God. Why? Because they're not born again. Jesus said, unless a person is born again, they cannot enter the kingdom of God. Nevertheless, they are they they have no actual sin. What they have, they're deprived of the the life of God in them. That's how we're born without Christ in us. But where there is no law, neither is there sin. So they have, there is no, they, they are not of a state where they can be held accountable to law. So they're in the limbo world, I guess, the, the, uh, the world of the uh, uh, not regenerate, not saints, but neither are they going to suffer for sins they did not commit. If they weren't aborted, I'm not advocating abortion, the kind of people that they would grow up with, for, with a mother, and probably not a father, or multiple, you know, what kind of life would they, would they experience? And they would become... Probably. I, I mean, I've seen some children raised, you know, some young children, seven, eight, nine, ten years old, uh, in families that are not good. And they're already wicked. They're already people you don't want to be around. And so in some cases, it's God's mercy when he cuts people's lives short. 
to keep them from what they will inevitably become or probably become. So we, uh, you know, I, uh, when I was doing work with the homeless over a whole lot of years on and off, and I've, I have compassion for these people, I do, but I've learned repeatedly that compassion itself does not save anyone. Only God saves people. And when we are compassionate for an individual, we must not forget that the society as a whole. So there's a lot of things that people do or like or approve of out of compassion, but things that don't actually solve the problem and sometimes make the situation worse. So, yeah, I think there should, uh, my personal opinion is abortion should not be legal because there should be laws, even if they're not vigorously enforced, to say this is what's right and this is what's wrong. Normally, uh, you know, the Ten Commandments would be sufficient for that. But you don't have to honor the Sabbath day. That's... But the law is for sinners. The law is not for saints. We don't need it. We've got Christ. They don't. Christ is far superior to any law. See, the covenant of Moses is utterly... It, it, can't give, it cannot give you life. It cannot save you. So it, it is not particularly useful. That, that's why it was only temporary until Christ would come. So one of the things going on now in the world, in the Christian world, is a, there's a lot of noise about Christian nationalism. And in the secular world, too. Oh, no, they're going to try to take over. Well, I don't think we have any candidates running. Uh, Trump certainly isn't a Christian nationalist. He's not a Christian. Trump is not committed to Christ. He, he doesn't belong to Jesus Christ. Trump belongs to Trump. And he is, he's an egoist. I mean, he, he, he's angry with the evangelicals that some of them have decided, well, we're not going to support him again. Well, I wouldn't support him again. He had four years, and he didn't do a very good job. He did. Yeah, he made all kinds of promises. Okay, did he actually uh, solve the problem of the border? A wall isn't a, a wall doesn't solve the problem of the border. Okay, people get over that wall. I lived down there for ten years. If they if they can get across the Rio Grande River, a little concrete wall is not much of a problem, especially for young men. With a uh, a, uh, a a a gas, uh, what do they call it? A, a a grappling hook and a rope. You just throw it over the top, go up one side, and you flip the rope over and go down the other side. Well, after you help your own family over, they can go over that easy. Those besides, they, they don't bother well now they don't bother to enforce it anyway. The problem is that, well, you have I don't approve of illegal immigration. I don't approve of it. But uh Actually, I think the people that do it are doing a disservice for the country they came from because the people that are willing to, to go to all the difficulties of coming to the United States, they're the kind of the people those countries need to build those countries. But those countries have bad government, just like we have in the United States. And the United States is, well, I think the, the immigration problem is going to solve itself because the United States is going to collapse. The economy here will collapse. The dollar is on is losing its monopoly on world trade, which means, you know, that deficit is going to actually mean something. And the money you've got in the bank is going to come become much less valuable. And if you think your gold is going to protect you, you're delusional. Or cryptocurrency, which is backed by nothing. What's the difference between cryptocurrency and the federal government money? Well, they can outlaw crypto like that, too, you know. It's just digital nothing. Uh, it, has no, it has no real value. Historically, currency, it had to have a 
had two purposes. It was a medium of exchange, and it was a store of value. Well, fiat currency or cryptocurrency or anything like that is not a store of value because it's, it doesn't have any intrinsic value in it. It's just a marker. It's just, you know, it can disappear like that because it's not real. That's why historically, gold and silver. In fact, the United States Constitution says the states can only coin gold and silver currency. The federal government reserved the right to produce useless paper. But even that was, was based on gold and silver up until, well, except at the beginning, up until uh, uh, the time of Richard Nixon. So Christian nationalism, what is this stuff? What is this stuff? And the world's all concerned about it, and I'm concerned about it for a different reason. The world doesn't want Christians to rule over them. <laughs> they don't want the law of God ruling over them. And that's what, uh, uh, this is, Christian nationalism is another term for theonomy. And theonomy is the idea of, it, technically it means God rules. But in reality, it means imposing the law of Moses on the world. Uh, one of the current theonomists that are fairly wide, widely known is a man named James White. Let's see if I've got something with his mugshot on it here. Oh, there's uh, Vody Bachman. Huh, huh. Well, here we've got, well, I don't know who's doing that. Roman Catholicism seems to be moving, well, they always were. Theonomy and the papacy seem to go together because it is a, you know, uh, Christian nationalism is state Christianity in some form. I can't find a picture of him right here. Okay. There he is. There's, there's James, White, James White and Doug Wilson. Yeah, both of them. Uh, <clears throat> now, the gospel according to James White and Doug Wilson is contained in this book <laughs> by the apostle Joe Boot. Yeah, th this is not Christianity. This is theonomy. Uh, this is... Uh, what theonomy is, it is it only exists among two groups of Christians. It exists among the Reformed, Presbyterian or Reformed, and some Reformed Baptists, Calvinists, Calvinists of a of the and Covenantalists, not New Covenant, Old Covenant, <laughs> Covenant those who hold to. Uh, uh, the um, covenant theology, which is a man-made system, including man-made covenants. But it only exists there, and it only exists really among post-millennialists. Because post-millennialists believe we are already in the millennium kingdom of Christ. They believe Christ is currently ruling and reigning over all things. Because they're Calvinists, they believe he rules over all things in exhaustive detail. Well, that's sort of an oxymoronic statement, though, because they believe that God has always done that. In fact, he, he decreed all things in exhaustive detail from before the beginning, from eternity. So what does, that's really pantheism. Everything is God's will, which is you know, that's if you actually think about Calvinism, it's like no. <laughs> but you have to understand it enough to figure out what it's saying, and once you figure out what it says officially in the creeds, like the Westminster Confession of Faith or the Second, the sixteen eighty nine London London Baptist Confession, you figure out. Wait, wait a minute. This isn't the God of the Bible <laughs> that they're talking about. No, nope, no, nope, it is not. So anyway, they have this other. They have their own ideas about what God is, what the gospel is. Apparently, 
Although, if, if you, they will say that Christ died for our sins on the cross, Christ rose again on the third day. You know, they hold to Orthodox Christian theology. But they have this idea that Christ is now ruling and reigning. And the mission of the church, that Christ has already come, he's already established the Millennium Kingdom, and he is now ruling and reigning, and the mission of the church is to actualize that rule through law. Although some of them was realize that, well, we're, we're waiting for this great revival when the majority of people become Christians, and you can have democratic Christian nationalism. Well, my experience with congregational-style government and churches is that, yeah, if you don't have a regenerate congregation, it's not going to work well. But where is that going to happen? I guess you'll have to turn to the Pentecostals and the Charismatics with their mythical, uh, oft-prophesied, end-time great revival. That The Bible doesn't talk about that. Jesus said there will be an end-time great apostasy, a falling away from the faith. The question is, is Christian nationalism part of departure from the faith? Uh, it, it's just like uh, liberalism, our modernist Christianity, at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, in the face of challenges from Darwin and uh, uh, higher, criti uh, higher biblical criticism, uh, form criticism, redactive criticism, uh, all these things, and textual criticism, which was the foundation for it. Uh, the Bible, we really can't know what the Bible says, uh, it, which is all rooted in human sinfulness because people don't want to be under the Word of God, so they want to eliminate it, eliminate it, eliminate it. Just like those who deny that Jesus is a Christ. They deny it because of sin, not of ev because of evidence. Because they're sinful, they want to escape the rule of God. They want to escape the presence of God. They want to hide from God. That goes all the way back 6,000 years to the garden. They covered their nakedness. How did they know they were naked? Well, they weren't naked until they began to feel naked because they had sinned and cut themselves off from God. And then when they heard God walking in the garden, yes, he could, could do that. He could become a man, and he could certainly appear. He's appeared in the presence of, uh, as uh, in a human form many times in the Old Testament, uh, or not many, maybe a few times. But, uh, yeah, so God can do that. Why not? I go for a walk with God. I don't have to see him. He has to go with me. He's in me. He's in every Christian, every born-again Christian. God dwells in you. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. The Spirit of Christ dwells in you. How can you go for a walk without him? It's just whether or not you are conscious of that fact. And, you know, I'm talking about praying, going out in the woods, to be alone with God, uh, to deal with some issues or whatever, and communicate with Him. And it is two-way. It's not. I don't hear a voice saying this and that. God gives me understanding. He enlightens me. He opens my mind to understand His Word, which is what the Bible says. I don't need to hear a voice. I don't need, if an angel appears, I say, huh, what's going on here? Who do you work for? I don't know you. I know him. I know Christ. I know who saved me. And when these imposters come along, he said, no, that's not the one who saved me. So, uh, but Christian nationalism, I, what is it? Why are these people trying to push it? Um, years ago, there was a, a pretty good preacher uh, out of uh, Florida. Uh, his name was uh, D. James Kennedy. Uh, his church service was tele uh, televised every Sunday morning. And when he talked about the gospel, he was good. Uh, he, uh, a Presbyterian, he actually advocated door-to-door -door evangelism, which I don't personally believe in, but it's not sinful. He had wrote a book on how to do it, a method how to do it. Well, you can't argue a person into the kingdom of God. I don't believe in debates. I, th I think this is nonsense. That's not how God works. Uh, it, convincing you of some facts is not the same as salvation. God has to do it. And Kennedy, I mean, if I had 
talked to him personally. I said, wait a minute, doesn't the Holy Spirit have to do this? He would have said, yes, of course. Then why did you write that silly book? Well, because God needed our help. Yeah, it's, we do things that are silly. Christians are silly. Often. I'm silly often. Um, we, we struggle in this world because we still have these mortal bodies in which sin dwells. So the Christian life is a life of struggle with ourself. Or to put it in the Islamic way, the, the greater jihad. Christians always are fighting the greater jihad, which is that internal struggle with yourself. Although in their case, it's not quite the same. <laughs> but, but they do. They do that's what they talk about the greater jihad and the lesser jihad, the, the holy war. The lesser war is the external jihad. Uh, that is usually raised uh, in defense of Islam or defense of Muslims. It's generally defensive. 9-11 was really defensive. Uh, it, it is against those who are fighting against them, normally. All right, so Christian nationalism, <clears throat> it is a serious problem. And it, it only, if, again, it afflicts the Reformed, uh, which includes the Presbyterians, uh, because of their theology. And particularly post-millennialists who believe that the, Christi uh, the millennium kingdom has already come, Christ is currently ruling and reigning on earth. There are no, as far as I know, there's, there's no Lutheran theonomists. There's no Lutheran dominionists. There's no Lutheran, uh, Lutherans who are pursuing uh, Christian nationalism, because it's not Lutheran. It's, it, it only grows in certain soil. The other soil that it grows in quite well is the charismatic movement, charismatic dominionism, uh, the, the idea that you can, can, can exercise authority over the world through char charismatic gifts. Um, it doesn't work, but <laughs> as has been aptly demonstrated, but it is popular. Uh, these are the same kind of people that believe in the prosperity gospel, the charismatics. It's, it's very, very widespread among charismatics. Um, you could say all charismatics to one degree or another, uh, and Pentecostals too. Uh, not just in the United States either. This is a global thing uh, because the, the, uh, uh, at its root, Pentecostalism and the charismatic movement are about power. They are not about salvation. It's about power. Power to get what you want in practice. Uh, they may not say that outright, but that's what th it is about. It, it is it's about using, obtaining spiritual power to get your desires. <laughs> Does that sound sinful? Yes, because it is. It is sinful, and that's that's why you know the, some of the most popular movements, and they're not fringe movements, except for theologically, like Kenneth Copeland, the prosperity gospel, that God wants you rich, God wants you healthy, God wants you happy, God wants you to have the best of everything, God wants you to have your best life now. Joel Osteen, that's why Joel has the biggest church, the biggest congregation in the United States. That's why he had to buy a sports stadium to meet in. But it's his church. It's not the Lord Jesus' church, as the sign says. The sign outside that church, and I drove by it. You know, we used to have to drive by it near it. Uh, we went back and forth between Wisconsin and Texas, family in, in, in Wisconsin. And the sign along the inter or the highway. Uh, the state highway there, as you go by, it uh, it says, uh, what does it say? Uh, I can't remember the name, actually, uh, the Life Something Church. The Church of Joel and Victoria Olstein. And that's exactly what it was. I saw that sign. Yeah, that's a true sign. It's not the Lord Jesus' church, it's their church. And how, how why is it so big? Because Joel tells people, they want to hear. 
why was uh, Rick Warren so successful and his methodology so, so, so successful? The Purpose Driven Church uh, was a book, and then he had The Purpose Driven Life that came later. It was about giving people what they want to get them to come to church. But the problem is, what if, if that's what they come to church for, you have to keep giving them that. And Rick Warren never understood the gospel. It's obvious in his book. He doesn't know what it is. He thinks it's, it's saying a prayer. It's saying a prayer. He doesn't know the reality of salvation. If he did, he would have explained that. But that reality of salvation, that's called, Jesus said you must be born again, is the work of God, not the work of man. So you can't give somebody a how-to book in it because it's not your works. It's God's work. We are his creation. New creatures in Christ. His handiwork. So, and God isn't, Right now, God is calling people out of the world, out of the nations, to be his people. He's not in calling everybody to be his people, or everybody does not respond, at least. The gospel is to be sent out into all the world, but not everyone responds. But it, there's, a, there's a work that God has to do with you. He has to convict you of your sin. You have to realize your, your true situation uh, before you will respond because you're sinful. And then he, he, but a sinner, even a sinner convicted by the Holy Spirit, knowing where you're headed and being thoroughly convinced of that, you're going to want to do what it takes. You're going to want to receive Christ. So you can call upon God out of, out of your desire to, to be saved even before you're regenerate unlike what the Calvin is saying. Uh, there, but again, this uh, Christian nationalism grows primarily there, intellectually only in Calvinism. Uh, not all Calvinists, most Calvinists regard it as a heresy, but uh, the, these ideas uh, require that soil to grow in. Uh, or charismatic movement, because in the charismatic movement, uh, thinking is not something you're supposed to do. You go by feeling. It's emotion. It's emotion. It's emotion. It's not, Thinking is a sin among charismatics. That might be putting a little too strongly, but it is, I mean, really. Because when I'm saying that, and I was in that movement long enough to know this, and I was a thorn in their side because I'd always, what the Bible says, see, I was saved not as a charismatic, but uh, I was Again, looking for okay. Here's the New Testament. How come the churches don't look don't look like this? So you, I spent some time trying to find something that was approximation. I'm not really satisfied with any of it. Uh, not until I'm in heaven with the Lord, I guess. Uh, the, I, the worship down here is just so shallow. My worship is so shallow. Just once in a while, just once in a while, I have, uh, you know, it's like I can go for a walk many times, but every once in a while I have a walk and it's really with the Lord. Or I pray, and I pray in the will of God, according to the will of God, and miraculous things happen. It's not a matter of how much power I have. It's simply a matter of praying according to God's will. And why don't I talk about that before I get lost in something less important? Uh, but it has to do with prophecy. It has to do with the book of Revelation and the end times and, and all everything that God says is going to happen. God did not spell everything out in exhaustive detail. He's, he has written what he's written in the, the scriptures, and those things must be fulfilled. But how those things are fulfilled is open. I don't believe in the exhaustive decree of all things. The Bible doesn't teach it. There is an openness, and we can affect how things play out. That's what prayer is about. Jesus told, including about the end times, he, he, he tells uh, the, uh, his, his disciples, pray that your flight from Jerusalem 
this could have been 70 AD too, by the way, uh, doesn't take place on the Sabbath or in the winter. So our prayer can affect the way and the timing and the circumstances of the fulfillment of prophecy. See, it's written in such a way it can be fulfilled in all kinds of different ways. Unlike the dispensationalists, they, they come down to their, oh, it's, it's got to be like this, it's got to be like this. No, it's not. It's not. It's like building, rebuilding a literal temple on Mount Zion. Is, is that literal or is that spiritual? I mean, there's all kinds of ways that, that, that God's Word can be fulfilled. The details haven't been given to us. We know some of the facts, not all the facts. So prayer can apparently affect how those things are worked out. It's just like I, I remember at least twice when I lived in the, on the Rio Grande River, right, right by the river down there uh, near Mission, Texas, uh, which is up oh, about an hour or so up from, from the coast, up the river from the coast. Maybe a little more than that, uh, by McCallan there. Uh, that we had hurricanes that were coming up the Gulf, and they were tracking right up the river, right up the river. Now, if you know that area, uh, the population is along the river. And then south of that, you have to really go down to Monterey in Mexico. And north of that, you've got to go up to like San Antonio before you hit any real population. And in between the river and those San Antonio or the river and Monterey, there's vast areas of prickly pear and cat's claw just, just uh, uh, that isn't even ranch ground. It is just, you know, empty and you have occasional small towns and ranches, ranches here and there. But a lot of it is impassable. And so much so that they don't even, they have a checkpoint, the border checkpoint, they have one uh, like 70 or 80 miles north of the valley because there's this impassable barrier of cactus and thorns, cat's claw thorns that just rip you. They, they look like claws on a cat. They just shred you. And people that try to pass through that uh, are highly likely to die, to, to get out there and get lost and die of dehydration uh, or other things, snake bite. And, you know, there's all kinds of things that can, can get you out there. So uh, that's another reason why I don't like illegal immigration coming across because you get out there and and the odds of dying, it's not worth it's not worth it. Your own country needs you more. Build your own country. Do what's right there. Uh, God's not calling you to break the law and come here. And raising, bringing your children to the United States, this, this is not a good country. This country is uh, rapid, well, it's, 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 it's rushing to hell. That's what it's doing. It is disintegrating before our very eyes over my lifetime. Don't raise your children in this country. You're better off someplace else. This is not a good place. It is not a good place. And it's not free. It's you're, People here are just as much slaves of sin as everywhere else, and often more so. Uh, riches, the, Jesus talked about the deceitfulness, deceitfulness of riches, of possessions. They're deceitful. You think they'll make you happy. They never, ever, ever do. That's why they're deceitful. They promise what they cannot deliver. We are meant to be the temples of God, to, the, to be the image of God. Only God can satisfy us. Everything else is deceitful. Everything else... Yeah, you can eat a good meal, and then afterwards you, re you regret it so often, right? It's like, oh, why did I eat so much? It's like, ugh. <sighs> yeah, I do that too often. But, again, prayer affects things. And so, twice... There was a hurricane coming right up. The track was, as it got closer, it, it settled down. And, I mean, this was close. It was like the next day, and they had it tracking right up the Rio Grande Valley, right through the population center. You've got cities like, uh, uh, let's see, uh, Reynosa, which is, was over a million people. You've got cities like uh, 
I was right across Monterey, uh, not Monterey, um, the one that's right across uh, down the river, uh, Metamoris. And on both sides, you've got, it's populated all the way up to like, <clears throat> McAllen, uh, Mission, other cities. Uh, Hild oh, let's see what's down at the, I can't remember what's on the English side on the other end. But uh, th these are large populations. And the hurricanes were coming right up there. And a lot of the people live in substandard housing. <laughs> I mean, really substandard, like old RV trailers, an old bus, an old school bus, or a little uh, building put together out of concrete blocks with some sticks for the roof. And I mean, a lot of these things, I remember a, hurricane, a tornado went through an area, uh, these are called colonias, and that's what we lived in, a colonia. Uh, we had a, a mobile home. And I remember there was about a, maybe two miles down the road, there's a, 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 a tornado report. And I went down there to look at the damage, and there was a couple things flipped over. But I looked at some of the stuff, and I looked at the news coverage, and I saw the news coverage. Well, those buildings looked like that before the tornado hit. <laughs> news coverage is worthless. These people are so dumb. <laughs> I mean, that was, in my, that was in my neighborhood. Texas neighborhoods are really large. You know, it's like 20 minutes to get down to the grocery store or the gas station. Uh, but anyway, I, I saw these things coming, and I just felt compassion for the people there, and I w began to pray and intercede according to the will of God. It wasn't my desire. It was his desire, and I was just interceding before the throne of grace according to the will of God. And both times, you know, sort of like Abraham at the, as the interceding, over Sodom and Gomorrah. And, uh, but God has people there, too, you know, in the valley, lots of people. And so I just was asking God, Lord, you know it's going to happen if that storm comes up the river. You know how just devastating it's going to be. Please send it off to one side or the other into that empty area. And both times it veered off and went away from the population centers. Never struck a major city when it was there. Never. We had one come close, a little north of us, but didn't do any damage. Yeah, just real minor stuff. So, uh, yeah, you can change things. Prayer, as, as uh, James writes, the fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Who is a righteous man? Someone who believes in Christ. His righteousness. Not your righteousness. His righteousness. All you, or the, the Apostle John writes in 1 John, if we ask anything according to his will, that's the key, according to his will, what is consistent with God's desires and plan? We know that he hears us. And if we know he hears us, we know we have what we've asked for. As Jesus said in the Lord's Prayer, uh, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But it's praying and interceding inside the revealed will of God. For example, you know God wants all people to be saved. And his, his, his uh, atonement of Christ is for all people. Calvinist is for all people. That's what the Bible says. That's what the Scripture says. Literally, it says that. In the Greek, it says all, and it means all, not all kinds. It means all. That form is very specific. Some of these Greek teachers need some lessons, like James White. He should know better. He's taught Greek, but he just repeats the, the stories he's been told, like from John Owens. Yeah, the death of death and in the death of Christ is just a polemic. It's not about the cross. It's a polemic. It's a polemic. It's it's clickbait. The, the title is clickbait. I don't like John Owens anymore. Yeah, some people, you know, they're talking about him and, oh, yeah, that's wonderful. No, he's not. He's clickbait. It's 
see it on, on the YouTube all the time, clickbait. But, uh, yeah, so we can, we can alter things as Christian. If you're a Christian, if you're born again, because people that aren't, see, that's one of the reasons, too. We are called a holy nation, a royal priesthood. Who will intercede for those who don't know Christ? They can't intercede for themselves because they can't come before the throne of grace because they're not atoned for. They are not in Christ. We can. We are called to do that. Just like the situation in the Middle East. The, 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 the wickedness is going on. I mean, these are like a, a cat and dog fight over there. Just, and both sides have a history that goes way back of doing these kind of things, of genocide. Islam, from its beginning, almost from its beginning, Gen, uh, from, from the time of uh, Abraham or uh, Muhammad engaged in genocide, wiping tribes out in Arabia. And Israel, the state of Israel, since its founding, it was founded on ethnic cleansing and genocide from its very beginnings, and it's been doing that ever since, sporadically, but it's been doing that. They have never learn peace. Why? Because they're not of God. Neither is Islam. It's not of God. They are sinners with unregenerate hearts. And they're filled with hate. And it shows. It shows. You know, we have people out there that think they, they've got all kinds of power and everything else. Well, guess what? The president can't turn the hurricane away. Well, you can't. See, I'm just a Christian. I'm just a born-again Christian that believes God. I know God. So if you're a born-again Christian, so do you. I'm nothing special. I'm not a prophet. I simply know God. I know what he said. And he'll move you to intercede. That's why his Spirit's in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. But you can sort of tell when you're, when you're praying according to God's will, in his spirit. It's not speaking in tongues. No, it's not gibberish. But he is moving in you to do his will. And you're praying according to his will. And you can sort of sense that. And when you do that, it will happen. Because it's inside of us. It is the will of God. So like, why did, why did Jesus tell us to pray, may thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven? Because we are his priests, interceding for this lost world in the presence of God. We are his temple. We have been cleansed. The priest in the Old Testament that came into the Holy of Holies, First of all, he had to bring an offering for himself. We have that, the one offering of Christ, the blood that atoned for us. And because it's atoned for us, we can pray before the throne of grace for those who have not yet come to him. We are their intercessors. They have no others. The Jewish people have no intercessor. We are... We are the intercessor before God's in Christ, in Christ as his people. The same goes, as Jesus prayed before the city of Jerusalem, so also we pray as his people, Christ in us. We're not doing this separate from him. We are not separate Christs. It's the same for Islam. They have no atonement. If they do not come to Jesus, they will die in their sins, just like the Jewish people will. They will die in their sins. There is salvation in no other name. And if your theology says something else, you have been deceived by the devil. And then we have the people that have decided to, 
to just shelve all that, to shelve all that we have in Christ, all that we have in the new covenant, as God's, as being God's people in this wicked world, and deciding that they want to pursue a political agenda and legislate God's law. Christian nationals. It's like the abortion thing. The abortion thing. What does it accomplish? It doesn't change people's hearts. It doesn't bring anyone to salvation. Law, even God's law, saves no one. It simply condemns sinners. Do not be caught up in this foolishness. Remember, well, let's go there. What's, what is God's agenda? What did God commission us to do? What did God, Christ send us out to do? Go, therefore, and make disciples. Disciples are people, not nations. Disciples of all the nations, of all the ethnicities. Baptizing, because this is not political nations. These are ethnic group, ethnos. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and lo, all that Christ has commanded us. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And for those that say, they'll say, well, you're supposed to Christianize nations, Christianize the, the no, that's the ethnic, ethnic groups? Not really. Yeah, there's been people that taught that too, missionary things. And they're wrong. There's something wrong. To be a disciple, you have to be a person. You have to follow a person, Jesus. And you have to be a person to be a follower of him. It has nothing to do with, with national political structures, which is a recent invention too. In Mark, what do we hear? Just in case you don't understand the first one, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Every creature is not really right. All creation. I have an issue with that every creature translation. It's not really what it's supposed to be. See, I, I, I will judge translations. I'll even look at the original text and say, which one's right? How can I do that? The Spirit of truth dwells in me. Am I infallible? No. I get things wrong, but God's not wrong. I trust him. You don't have to trust me. Trust him. Don't look to me. Look to him. See, so, so if, if you're not sure, if somebody's twisting one verse, look at the other verses. God uses redundancy in the Scriptures. He doesn't say it simply in one place. He, if it's important, he says it over and over again just to prevent the Bible twisters from doing what they want to do because they're sinners, sinful. Even born-again Christians can twist the Bible. We can, our flesh wants to distort it. We have this struggle within us. As the Muslims call it, the greater jihad. But we have it really. They don't. Because they don't have a, con they have a contention between themselves, their flesh, and the Quran which is very fleshly. Uh, and the fact, you know, how, how do they, because they're not, they don't have any grace. The Quran says God is merciful, but how? Arbitrary mercy. mercy. It's, it is, it has nothing to do with, uh, and there's no atonement. There's absolutely no atonement. It is, it is an empty system and it's a system of bondage. And who's going to intercede for them except for, for us? There is more than one and a half billion Muslims in this world. Do not let the government instilled fear and hate that goes back to 9-11 and other things and simply the prejudice produced in this nation, especially by a certain very powerful community that wants us to be prejudiced against Muslims. And let's remember there are as many Arabs who are Christians, too. 
Uh, in fact, where did where did Christianity start? Not in the United States or in Europe. No, Jerusalem was not in Europe, is it? It's in Asia Minor. So uh, it's right, right at the crossroads of the world, isn't it? Africa, Asia, Europe, all meet right in that area, uh, which is probably why God chose it. Who's going to intercede but those who are of the royal priesthood, the priests of the king? Us. Not ruling and reigning until Christ returns, but again, as intercessors before the throne of grace, the throne of God, for those who can't intercede for themselves because they are not in Christ. Luke chapter 24, verse 47. And that repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Repentance is not putting away your sin. Repentance is a change of mind. It is putting away your self-righteousness and turning to Christ in faith. If you have to put away your sins before you come to Christ, you will never, ever come to Christ. And there's been some really bad teaching over the years about this, including in Pentecostalism. Repent of your sins. There's such an ignorance, and a, the traditional understanding is wrong. It is not re putting away your sins. It is putting away your self-righteousness and your hostile and turning to God. As that popular song goes, just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. That's the only way you'll come to Christ. If you want to make a plea based on something else, uh-uh, you'll never get there. The door is locked. The door is only open to those who come solely trusting in him, crying out to him. If you don't have faith, cry out to him. If you know you're lost, if you know you do not know him, if you know you need salvation, that is sufficient. Cry out to Christ to save you from your sin, to save you from who you are, and he will hear you. But don't try to make a deal with God. God doesn't make deals. That repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name, in his name, to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. That is the mission of the church. That is the only mission of the church, and anything else is a satanic diversion to get our focus off of that onto something else. Now, brothers and sisters, that you can hear, if you can hear me on the Internet, you have the tools to proclaim the gospel. At this moment, at least while the door is open, we can use the Internet to be heard around the world. Perhaps you speak Arabic. Perhaps you speak Yiddish or Hebrew or Spanish or French. One of the most gone godly countries in the world, the French. Or unlike me, you can speak English or whatever, Native American. Of course, a lot of people speak multiple languages. If you're a Native American and you're a born-again Christian, you know that no matter where you go in this world to nowadays, there is some connection to the Internet. It might be a dish out in Africa or with musks, little things. could be out on the, uh, what is that, uh, reservation in South Dakota, the big one. Something pines, I think. Huge restoration out there. Native Americans. I mean, there's a... I've, I've, I, in the valley, when I was down there, there was a, a church, and the guy was, was really into ministering to them. Uh, 
but he had he had his people in his church doing Native American drumming and everything else, and like, wait, these people aren't Native Americans. What is that doing? How do you proclaim the gospel to them? We we get into all these other things. We we try to to use our own wisdom rather than God's wisdom. We try to to use charity or or good deeds or or other things to try to reach people. That's not God's way. He said, proclaim the message, pro- proclaim the gospel, proclaim the good news of Christ, that salvation is in him and no one else. That is what we're supposed to do. Not invent human gimmicks using human wisdom. Just proclaim it. It is the Holy Spirit's job to convict people of their sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they do not believe in Christ. Of righteousness because he's no longer present visibly on earth. So convict them of what is holy and righteous and the fact that they fall short. And of judgment because the God of this age, Satan, has already been judged. He is not yet incarcerated, but he is already judged, and his kingdom is coming to an end. Along with that, the kingdoms of this age, of this world. It's coming to an end. And in the meantime, before Christ's ascension, and Christ's return is the time while during which we must proclaim the gospel into all the world as a witness to all nations. And then the end of the age comes. We have the technology. I know when I was running a, a website uh, quite a few years ago now that you can look at, if you got a web server someplace, you can look at the uh, the access records to see where people were accessing it from or things were accessing it. And there was countries all over the world. All over the world. I didn't have that much traffic, but there was still you know, Russia, uh, Europe, England, Australia, all kinds of people. Something, you can sort of tell if it's a machine or a, or a, a regular person, too. But uh, the technology is there. We can, we can go into all the world without having to go into all the world because so many people are connected nowadays for good and for evil. We need to use this, go out into this world using these tools that God has given us. You don't have to. You can go bang on your neighbor's door, too. But uh, we need to take advantage of this, though, and use it. But we have to remember it is to communicate the gospel. And Satan is always trying to divert us into other things because we see all these things going on in the world, like what's going on in Gaza now. it's It's a huge crime. But the only answer is Christ. You can't ever fix that, and law will never fix that. The UN can't fix that because the problem is in human hearts. The problem goes back 6,000 years. And Christ came 2,000 years ago to begin solving that problem, to begin the repairs. And God is not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance, all come to the knowledge of truth, all come to salvation. And this is the time when we can proclaim that, can proclaim that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to die on that bloody cross in order that all those who are believers in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Only he offers that, and only he can bring it to fulfillment, and only through faith in him.